Thank you. Great. Send it to you. Thank you.
provide leadership to the university during these very challenging times as a search for a new president is underway. So without uh, any further delay, let me uh, please introduce uh, President Stanley Eichner. <laughs> changed 
but nonetheless, if you look back on it, uh, we now think about those as, as uh, pretty good days in fact. Uh, but the one, one thing that never occurred to us is we, we always thought that we could win a little or lose a little in terms of our state appropriation, but the concept that the state would not actually pay us never occurred to us. <laughs> I don't think we could have, we could have spent uh, years planning for unforeseen contingencies, and I don't think that would have been one of them. We just assumed that once the appropriation was passed and signed, that the money would come forward. But this past year, for the first time in any material way, we ended up with a $120 million unpaid balance on the state appropriation last June 3rd. So we moved into this fiscal year uh, over $120 million short, and it was September by the time the state had satisfied its obligation. Uh, in the meantime, the, this year's appropriation was delayed as well, so by the end of December, we were $436 million behind in terms of the state actually sending the check to uh, pay the state appropriations plan over the, over the year. Um, we've bounced around ever since then. I think the official number we have received some payments. We received the $45 million uh, stimulus payment. We received some other modest payments. But, and, and today we're about $464 million in arrear. My guess is we'll end up this year probably in the range of about 480, 490 million, just short of 500 million in arrears compared to last year's 120 uh, million. So I think two or three things can be said. The good news that I promised is that we're going to be able to continue uh, our operations in an orderly way, meet our uh, payroll, do the other kinds of things that a university must be able to do. We're going to be able to do that through the end of this fiscal year. Then what will happen next year if the state fails to solve its underlying financial problem? Uh, will the state, for example, whoops, excuse me. That, that's probably the governor calling right now. <laughs>
really think that is a resoundingly bad idea uh, for a whole lot of reasons. Number one, it, it moves from the state to the university the responsibility not only for borrowing but to paying the interest on the borrowing and the risk associated with borrowing. So I think uh, it's bad from that respect, but it also digs an even deeper fiscal hole and it kind of kicks the can down the road. Having said all of that, um, <coughs> my guess is the state will pass borrowing authority. And if they do, I think it, we need to be on that bill, the debt granting authority, the borrowing authority. And we will probably end up having to borrow monies going into the, the next fiscal year. So, um, that is kind of the, the cloud that uh, is, is out there. Um, where does higher education stand in terms of the, the uh, priorities of the state of Illinois? I think that uh, all of education in Illinois has, has for too long been taken for granted as something that um, just always existed, all would, always would exist. But what we've seen, particularly in terms of higher education, is a gradual diminishment of, of state priority and state support, particularly during the, if I don't risk becoming uh, too political here, but particularly during the Blagojevich, Blagojevich administration, you begin to see direct uh, decline in state support and a widening gap between support by the state to the elementary and secondary schools and a, a decline um, for higher education. For the University of Illinois, we're $100 million below where we were even eight to 10 years ago in terms of state support. And as a result, our tuition has increased
meantime, I think uh, the pluses that are here to look at, number one is uh, with all the changes that have come about in the university, as painful as they were, I think we uh, are going to emerge stronger and better for it. The current board of trustees is the best board I've ever worked with. It is um, highly engaged, very well informed, highly ethical, and um, so I think that I think that the performance of a governing board, frankly, <coughs> largely flies below the radar of for most members of the university community. But the quality and integrity of the governing board ultimately is incredibly important to the to the well-being of the university. So I think um, our strength at the top, if you will, <coughs> provides a, a firm foundation on which uh, to to build and grow. The search for a new president is uh, going extremely well. And so I'm confident that within the next month or so, the Board of Trustees will be able to announce an appointment of a new president. I think that will be uh, just a very strong, good uh, step forward. And um, from what I know, I think you will be very, very impressed and positively uh, inclined toward the, the new leadership. Here it goes again, but I'm going to continue to resist <laughs> the temptation. I don't see a Springfield number. <laughs> um, um, the, uh, the other thing that uh, I think uh, bodes well for our future, and then I'd like to just go to, to your question and comments, is the, um, the, the quality way in which members of our faculty and staff have worked their way through the challenges of the last year. We've gone some, through some very tough period, uh, periods uh, over the last year, some on this campus, even to a greater degree in Urbana-Champaign, some in Springfield as well, on the Springfield campus. But the um, quality, integrity, strength, leadership within our faculty and staff has really been quite uh, commendable. And I think that provides us a very strong platform uh, moving forward. From every vantage point, the going forward is to understand that uh, if higher education was important to society 20 or 30 years ago, it is even more important today. The whole economy has changed. Uh, the ability, the capacity to um, comprehend, adapt, innovate, create, all of those things that are fundamental to higher education are more important today in 2010 than they've ever been before. So are we, are we uh, too big to fail, too important to fail? Uh, the answer is, is fairly obvious, yes. So I, I think uh, uh, we both have uh, the will to work our way through this, but we also, uh, I think, should retain a um, strong element of optimism that um, we are simply so essential to the future functioning of a healthy society that we simply have to work our way through this uh, rough patch, and, and uh, we'll do that. Um, I think. I thank all of you for the service you are giving to the University of Illinois now and the service you've given to the University of Illinois over many, many uh, years. It is uh, a great good fortune for me to be able to be back uh, today and to see many of you again. So why would I take 
some of your questions. We've distributed some index cards. If you would like to pass those cards down to the aisle, I'll ask uh, uh, Dick Johnson to uh, collect the cards. And Mrs. Gassman. And we'll read them at the microphone for the president. So I'm not sure I trust Dick Johnson to, to give me an Our organization, SUAA, uh, urged the governor to veto that legislation. Um, and as I am, I think he has not followed our advice. I think it may have been signed yesterday. Although I don't know, it hasn't really been signed yesterday. I don't know. Last I, I heard I, it. Had I was not. told that, uh, that that was going to happen. May have been, yeah. Um, but um, uh, Sua opposed it not because it set up a new tier. I think everyone uh, pretty much accommodated itself to, to that, uh, but uh, it's, it's uh, a very bad piece of legislation and it's very bad for higher education. Uh, I won't go into the, uh, the elements of that, but uh, we think that it will profoundly affect the ability of, uh, of higher education to recruit and retain highly capable uh, folks for the faculty and other uh, positions. Now, another thing, um, well, assuming that Quinn signs a Senate Bill in 1946, or has already signed it, uh, in the next session, SUA will uh, propose amendments to remedy the Act's uh, shortcomings. Uh, particularly from the standpoint of, high, of, of uh, protecting higher education generally in the state. Um, SUA will continue to oppose directly any, and I use these two words that I'm sure you've heard many times, uh, diminishment or impairment of pension benefits of current employees as uh, we view are clearly unconstitutional. Uh, so, with that kind of preface, some specific questions. Would the U of I join with SUAA and other uh, groups in uh, working to uh, change or remedy the shortcomings of six, uh, 1946 in the next session? And um, uh, that's one of my questions, now a little hard, more hardball kind of question. Um, you are mentioned in the Sun-Times editorial indicating that you support changing benefits for current employees. And Sorry, I have a call I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, as I say, not that we're the biggest and most powerful group in the, in the state, but we will work hard to, to prevent that from happening. Um, actually, I'm, I'm not sure I got all that last question as, as the phone went off. Let me, let, me, let me respond, and then if I'm not on target, you'll, 
at me, and this may be the point at which you'll want to rescind your earlier applause. <laughs> uh, but let me make a couple of points. Um, I believe the evidence is that um, for whatever combination of reasons, the Illinois, the state of Illinois, in all of its pension systems, has uh, an incredible problem. Uh, of underfunding of those systems and the sustainability of those systems uh, to the point that that um, two things, if left undependent, I think there are two dangers. One is that the, the payments for our pension benefits and our health care benefits uh, is now exceeding the direct support we get from the state. So we're going to be paying more to sustain our pension and the health care benefits. The state is going to be paying more to sustain our pension and health care benefits than it's paying to support faculty salaries and other current operations. Uh, and so long term, if that, if that differential continues to grow, uh, that, if that is a, uh, a problem. And the second aspect to it is that among the 50 states, our problem is more severe than any other state, and I think the outlier is California. But except for California, uh, we, we are uh, the worst. So the question is how to deal with that. And I think the first thing, that, in all fairness, it needs to be stipulated up front is if the state had been making proper payments to the pension system over the last 20 years, and particularly during the last 10 years, we wouldn't have a problem. Arguably, we wouldn't have a problem. But uh, in fact, they, they were not. Uh, and uh, so we've got problems with, there are five different pension systems in the state or beyond SERS, uh, SERS is actually in better shape than some of the others, but all of them are in, in, uh, in jeopardy. And the, uh, the prospect of uh, those pension funds actually moving from taking in money to paying out money and moving toward insolvency is um, a very, very difficult scenario to, to contemplate. So I think we have some obligation, we do have an obligation to current and future employees to make sure that those pension funds are stable, sound, and, and sustainable. The, the, I don't, uh, would we support Changes in the in the currently passed legislation. Uh, I suspect so, but that would that would depend upon the nature of the, of the changes and so forth. Uh, but very likely, we are going to have to make some changes going forward for those who've already retired or those who've already accumulated benefits. I think the general view is that those are constitutionally protected benefits, and they, they, those cannot be on uh, the table. So the question is, what about benefits for new hires? And yes, those could be. That is one way to adjust the, uh, the out-year obligation. You don't save much in the short term, but you could make the system more solvent in the long term. And then what about a person uh, who may be 32 years old, has another 30 years of service to the University of Illinois? What, if, what about alteration in their benefits going forward? That's a gray area, but the argument there is at least legally held by some that yes, you could make some, you couldn't take away any benefits that they'd already Accumulated, but yes, you could uh, going forward. I think the big, the bottom line is um, we need to fund those pension 
benefits that have been uh, accumulated and act enacted and that for whom uh, individuals have both a legal and a moral obligation to receive. Uh, but we also need to be sure that we're, we're spending every higher education dollar as wisely as we can and that we're not shortchanging future generations uh, to pay for pension benefits and or pension systems that, that may be unsustainable going forward. The, the problem with the pension system generally is that uh, in years past it has been easy to uh, resolve budget impasses, labor contracts, other uh, problems in state government simply by granting some changes in the pension benefits that we wouldn't have to pay for now and that would only come due at some undefinable point in the future. Well, we're, we may be at that un, undefinable point in the future. And so the question is, what do we do about that? We can't take away anything that has been earned and committed and so forth, but what can we do going forward so that, that we um, have a system that is sound and healthy in every respect? So uh, that's maybe not, may be or may not be responsive to your question, but I think my position from the very beginning is, yeah, we need to be willing to look at the pension system along with everything else and put it on the table along with everything else while at the same time both protecting and safeguarding the pension benefits of those who are now retired or who will in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years be the beneficiaries of that system. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a question that probably is on the minds of a number of people here. As an academic professional, when contracts are renewed in the fall, will the furlough reductions be enshrined as a reduction to salary of 5%? Uh, it says, can you refuse the reduction? Oh. Uh. To be quite honest about it, I don't know the answer <laughs> to that. I think from a policy standpoint, the furlough program that we instituted this year, uh, and of course I won't, if, the, if the God is willing and the creeps don't rise, I won't be president. <laughs> but my advice to my successor is that uh, we not go back to furloughs uh, next year as a way of solving our budget problems. I think it is a, uh, a very crude management tool that um, uh, I think there are better ways going forward. We had to do what we had to do this year as an emergency measure, but we've had enough advance notice now that next year is likely to be tough as well. That we ought to be able to exercise other options. So whether we'll actually include the language in the um, whether we'll actually include the language in the contracts for academic professionals and others, I honestly don't don't know. Uh, but even if we did, it would be my intent not to exercise it. All right, question. Uh well, you, you sort of answered it. Uh, what are you doing to actively protect pensions and other benefits of current employees? I would, uh, I guess I would ask the question this way. Um, March 24th, I, as a political scientist, I, I don't know, I, it was a terrible process. Of these, there was no bill, and uh, essentially, and uh, these benefits were changed within 12 hours. At most, I understand, and uh, I mean the die was already cast, and and, uh, and, and it produced.
used as one would expect, pretty bad, uh, pretty bad uh, consequences in many ways. But uh, I guess the question has to do with um, does the University of Illinois participate? I mean, does anybody ask uh, what we should be doing about this situation uh, from the legislature? Uh, Yes, I think uh, if we can spot a train that's moving, certainly we would want to be a part of, of that discussion. Uh, but I think the current, the, this last piece of legislation came to us as just as much a surprise as it did everybody else. I did meet with uh, Senate President Cullerton uh, in March, and he did indicate, early March, he did indicate pension reform was likely to be on the legislative agenda. And in retrospect, I, I should have said, well, specifically, what do you have in mind? Uh, I don't know whether he could have answered that question at that time or not. But certainly now that pension reform is on the table going forward, it will be an area that if we can possibly insert ourselves into the conversation, we will. Maybe you could uh, say something to get uh, to, to the uh, usage of the word reform. Uh, it, the, it's an exercise to take money away. And uh, whether uh, uh, what is produced is uh, uh, better uh, is, is, uh, is questionable. Uh, now, we keep ha being hammered by the <coughs> Chicago Tribune and others about our gold-plated pensions. And Cadillac, I think, is the term. Or Cadillac. <laughs> Maybe we should use another Say but anyway, um, it's it's um, uh, it's 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 a. Uh, I know they use that that language a lot, but it's it's uh, the data show. I mean that uh, the benefits of our system are middle middle of the road. Uh, the cost to the state of uh, of, the, of the normal costs. That is, if we didn't have the, the $90 billion uh, unfunded liability out there, uh, the cost of the state, if they paid their, as Fred Yurtz has indicated, yeah. if they, over these years, have not taken pension holidays and so forth, uh, then uh, the, the current system would be something like 107% yeah. fully funded. Rather than 42, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that, that's, that's, uh, that's, Quite, uh, quite correct. The, the, um, I think the, the gold, gold plated, the, the Cadillac language. I had a um, opportunity to sit in on a useful dialogue with uh, representatives from the Civic Committee and representatives from our local UIC faculty about a week ago on on that issue, and so there were. There were, let's say, uh, very heated and energized conversations going back on both sides. I think the, the one problem for those of us who hear these ads is that, um, number one, they do have an edge on them, as all ads tend to do. Number two, uh, the weakest link, link in a chain often stimulates the most criticism. Our serves benefits are not, for the most part, are not out of line at all. But there are other pension systems in which there are arguably uh, aspects, policy aspects to them that could very well be brought up uh, for discussion and potential revision. And, and those hurt us uh, just as much as, as if they were part of us. But I, I think, uh, again, that's, that's probably why we need, there are some pension systems you can retire as early as age 50. Well, if you retire at age 50, then you, you know, how are you going to accumulate the, the necessary payments to you know, pay out pension benefits until you, you leave, uh, until you, die maybe a 
get to 80 or 85 or 90 or whatever, uh, it becomes quite a challenge. Now that we're living longer, just think about it. You have a 75-year-old president. <laughs> How much you used to be, you know, think you'd be rolled around in a wheelchair uh, at that age. So we are living longer. So there are, there. I think there are opportunities going forward to make constructive, uh, non-punitive, let's call them changes rather than reforms. I think that's a fair comment. But uh, um, part of the strategy, I think, on the pension reform issue is simply that if you look at the overall financial um, threat to the state of Illinois, and Illinois state government, the, the size of the pension liability outweighs everything else in combination. So it, it, to talk about solving the budget problems of the state of Illinois without talking about pension reform is, is very difficult. So I, I think that's what brings me back to saying, yeah, let's, let's talk about uh, Relieving the amount of unnecessary regulation, state regulation on our universities. Let's talk about, you know, K-12 and higher ed funding. Let's talk about Medicaid, but then also let's talk about what we can do to, to secure the funding and the sustainability of the state's pension funds. Uh, this is uh, a question that's quite apropos to what you're saying. Is it time for the university to own and operate its own fringe benefit program, uh, retirement, uh, health, uh, health insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we may be, uh, in fact, we're, we're headed down that line. Uh, you know, it may be that new, I think new employees now have the opportunity to move directly into TIA credit. And so, which is a defined contribution program so uh, it may be that going forward, uh, new employees disproportionately will elect that portable system of pension rather than the traditional uh, state system. If you look back over the last 10 years, increasing amounts of both health care and pension costs have been shifted to the university. I'd like to believe that's not going to happen in the future, but I think it will. So it isn't just saying, well, these are costs that will be borne by the state eventually and we shouldn't worry about them. I think we have to worry about them both from a citizen standpoint as if they were our own costs, but practically, you know, five years from now, they may in fact be our costs and we need to be able to be sure that we can pay them. Uh, I think you're referring to the uh, managed, self-managed programs where you could have things like TIA. Right, so right, right. Uh, it's interesting, however, under those programs, the state would be required to make their payments to these yeah. right off the top, right, right away. They couldn't do this uh, hocus pocus cookie jar yeah. approach to. Uh, yeah. Um, Urbana has implemented inducements to spur retirements. Why has this not been done at UIC? I think it's recalcitrant management here. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> no, I think, uh, uh, I can't fully explain it, but I, I do think that, that, let me see if I can explain it as best I can. I think the position of the Chicago campus and the Springfield campus was, they have, they believe they had enough flexibility within their current policies to be able to provide the needed incentive for employees to retire if they wanted to retire and that they need, didn't need to set up a special program. The other reason I think, quite frankly, is that the age profile of the Chicago campus, I am guessing, may be younger than the age profile at the other two campuses. And so for that reason, uh, with, a, with a younger overall uh, faculty and staff profile, that may have uh, poured on the decision. But it, 
basically was, uh, from my standpoint, I needed to look at it to say, do I want to allow the Urbana campus to offer this incentive? And if the answer to that is yes, do I want to require Chicago to offer the same incentive? And my decision was that it really ought to be that, that we could tolerate some variance there in terms of campus policy. So it was a decision that I think was reached in good faith by each of the three campuses. Uh, having been uh, involved with this campus for uh, over 40 years, I think the, there are differences. I think we age faster here. <laughs>
this is something that's more limited to concerns of, of our organization. Why can't the business office enact uh, enact deductions for SUAA dues? In other words, for current, current employees. For current employees. Now, sir, if you're already retired, of course, as you, I don't know, are you retired? Or what are you? I think so. <laughs>
so what we have is an accumulation over the last half dozen years of, of that train wreck, <coughs> having said no to additional revenues and yes to more spending. So we will have to bring down spending and we will have to increase revenues. And that's the tough job that faces all of the policymakers. So I think any support that you as citizens and as an organization can lend to that uh, would be very, very helpful. Moving us from where we are to where we need to be. SUA is strongly, as you know, have you said it's strongly in favor yes. of tax. Revenue enhancement meaning a, a tax increase. I've been able actually to let the actual three letter word come out of my lips. No, well, I know that last call was from the press corps saying, yeah. I can very support a doubling of the state. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll let the president return his message now. And uh, we are serving lunch next door for those of you who have the red border badges. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.